So we're talking about um, one of the functions of sugar is storage molecule. Um, we store individual monomers typically as polysaccharides or chains, polymers of monosaccharides. Uh, in these storage molecules, they can be used also to be building blocks for cellular structure. And I have just introduced starch, which is actually a layman's term, but you're all familiar with starch in some sense. And you would most likely, well, if I were to ask what what uh, what do you associate starch with, you're probably talking to take, right? So we know that it's a storage molecule for plants like the games. I have a picture on uh, the board here of a couple different types of starches, and there are two that you need to be familiar with. One of them is amylose, OSD, and the other is amylopectin. Starch is really a chain of glucose, right? It's a chain of glucose. And we have those 1 4 linkages, and this is right about where we would have picked up. So these individual glucose monomers are bonded together through their first and their fourth carbon with a neighboring glucose molecule. Now, when we organize the atoms between individual monomers of glucose with this carbon-1, carbon-4 bond, this glycosidic linkage creates a molecule that actually begins to have a helical structure. That's just really the structure that, that uh, arises out of this type of bond. Okay, so one, we have a helix-like structure. The other thing, too, is the carbon-1, carbon-4 uh, atoms are on either side of the molecule. And so when we link a bunch of glucoses together to carbon-1 and carbon-4, it creates this very linear structure, or what we could also say as being unbranched. So when we have a molecule, so maybe I'll ask that an example. You're inspecting a sample and you find a polysaccharide that has a helical structure and is unbranched. You know that we're referencing this first type of starch, which we're going to call amylose. Now, I can also begin to look at the sixth part, and I can add monomers off of six carbons. As I start to do that, I deviate from that branch-like structure. So if I add in a second linkage, a one-sixth linkage, so now I have a molecule that has still the one-four linkages, but now I'm adding in a one-sixth linkage. That one-sixth linkage begins to create branching. So I could create a, a branch. Here's my sixth carbon right up here. And if I take another monomer, I can add it in through the first carbon. And so I get kind of this link or this branch off of there. And then I can proceed from here to put in 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4. And I get another helical structure if I just look at that single part of the molecule. Okay? When we have those one six linkages incorporated and we get that branching structure, it's no longer just simply amylose, it's called amylopectin. Okay, amylopectin is this <coughs> branch form of starch uh, that also has the one six linkages. So it becomes a storage molecule for certain plants, but we can also, or consumers, other organisms that consume plants and other individuals that consume plants, they are called consumers, and as consumers we can consume a potato, and you all know that we're going to digest starch. So we can digest both amylose and amylopectin. 
Now, the way that we need to be able to do this is we need to hydrolyze the starch. Now, you should all basically know what that means already. So start thinking about hydrolyze, hydrolyze, hydrolyze the starch. One, what's the chemical reaction that we're probably going to use? It's going to be a hydrolysis, and what does that mean? We're going to break something with water. So we have to break the starch with water. What are we most likely going to be breaking? What's that? Yeah, the bonds. Which bonds in particular? They're going to be my C1, C4, and my C1, C6 bonds. I'm going to release or I'm going to liberate and free those individual monomers. So we need to be able to hydrolyze starch, or we can't hydrolyze starch. And when we do that as humans, we're pulling the monomers out, those individual glucose, I'm just going to call those sugars, and we're going to use those for the cell. And we're going to use that as energy production. Now, this process does require energy. But yields a bunch of energy forks. So we can use it as an energy source. Now, what else would we need as humans or as organisms that are consuming a, a potato for lunch today to be able to utilize and break out those individual glucose markers? How do we catalyze any of our reactions in cells? Enzyme. We're going to need an enzyme. So animals have enzymes that allow the hydrolysis of starch. You maybe have already, I don't know, maybe that's what you're thinking this week. You're going to look at enzymes. And you're actually going to look specifically at an enzyme called amylase. Amylase is, should sound familiar because we're talking about amylose, so amylase probably acts on amylose, in fact it does. And this is the enzyme that we have that helps us to hydrolyze starch, and in fact humans have two different types of amylases. We have pancreatic amylase, which is released from the pancreas into the small intestine, but we also have salivary amylase, which is mixed in the saliva. So as soon as you start to eat that potato, you have a chemical reaction that begins to occur right there in your mouth. So you need to chop up those 1, 6, and those 1, 4, one four carbon bonds so that we can liberate starch, uh, individual glucose monitors from the starch molecule. Humans also have a version, and in, in, in really it's mammals in general that have a version of starch. It's called glycogen. Uh, and it's actually structurally going to be a little bit different. That's why we just don't call it starch because it's like starch, but it's not exactly the same bonds and everything. So glycogen is another storage polymer, polysaccharide, that we find in animals. Here is a picture of glycogen close up. You can see the individual, individual glucose monomers. You'll notice that we have 1,4 bonds, and we also have a 1,6 bond as well. So the bonds are really, really similar. We're going to get to a difference here in just a second. But they create these branch-like structures. Okay, one of the differences with glycogen is that it's extensively branched. Glycogen shows up at high concentrations in the liver and the skeletal muscle in mammals. And it shows up in this very extensively branched form.
So when an animal or a mammal has an increased metabolic demand, maybe it's in your sport today, when you're practicing, or you go for a run, or it's a stressful situation, all of these can lead towards increases in metabolic demand. When we have that increase in metabolic demand, we actually increase the hydrolysis of glycogen. So if I were to give you a starch molecule and I were to give you a glycogen molecule, very similar bonds. However, the bonds happen more frequently within the glycogen molecule. You may have that branching that occurs in a starch molecule that's very infrequent. In glycogen, it's very, very frequent, and even the branches have branches coming off them. Sugar is our energy source, ingredients, storage molecules. They're also going to be structural molecules for many different types of organisms. You've probably all heard of a molecule called cellulose, OSE, in the case that it's sugar. We find this primarily in plants, although we will find it in some other um, types of organisms, some cellulose in mushrooms. Fungi. This is actually the most abundant molecule on Earth. You can see amylopectin, and you can see glycogen. You can now see the differences, branches on top of branches on top of branches. And they have that same structure in C1, C4, C6, C1 bind. More prevalent here than in starch. Cellulose, very different. It actually forms a linear structure. Notice the bond is just a little bit different. Okay? And that bond's going to become really important. I'm going to try to take you through that here in the next couple of minutes. So really, we're not using glycogen and amylopectin or starch as storage or as structure molecules. We're more using those as storage. It's just where we can keep up glucose molecules. Cellulose, on the other hand, big component of the cell wall, which is that rigid structure that we find around plant cells and then the cell membranes on the inside. And the reason that we can do that is because we actually can facilitate some pretty unique structural capabilities. And it all comes down to this carbon-1, carbon-4 bond, and really the configuration. So cellulose is this chain-like molecule. That's very starch-like. Okay, so it's this chain of glucose that's starch-like. And that starch-like glucose just like glucose has an OH on its number one carbon. However, there are two forms or two ways in which that OH can be put on. And hopefully you're beginning to see that that OH on that first carbon can be below the molecule or it can be above the molecule. Okay, so here's an example of two different glucose. One's alpha D glucose, glucose the other's beta D glucose. Do D because it's right-handed. The alpha and the beta reference to what's going on here on the first carbon. 
the OH is below the molecule. Remember that this structure here, this carbon ring, is basically the plane of the molecule. So I can take that and I can rotate it. And if I were to look at it, I would have my hydrogen coming off the top and my OH is coming off the bottom here in this alpha glucose configuration. Whereas over here, that OH is now coming off the top, the H is coming off the bottom. Okay? If you look around it, everything else is pretty much the same. Oxygen is the same, hydrogen and OH on carbon two are the same, here on three, here on four, and then here on five and six. In carbon one, you have that difference. Okay? So keep this idea in mind. Keep that planar surface in mind. So the two configurations that we can have, the alpha configuration, And that's going to have the OH group below the plane surface of the molecule. And then we can have the beta configuration. So now this is going to be above the plane's surface. Alpha configuration will be like starch and glucose, uh, not glucose, glycogen rather. And that beta configuration we will find in some of those. Okay. So what are the consequences of having the OH in either position. Well, you will remember that to put these molecules together, what kind of reaction do we require to put monomers of sugar together? What's the reaction that forms the glycosidic linkage? Anyone remember? What's the reaction to form our glycosidic linkage? How do we put two individual monomers of glucose together. The reaction, being the reaction. Hydrolysis breaks it apart. You put water in to break it apart, dehydration to put it together, right? The molecule are going to lose water. That means that we need an OH to be able to interact with an H to generate the water as it leaves the molecule. Okay? So the consequence here of using this beta configuration when we have our alpha configuration, the 1,4 linkages, you end up with your glucose all in the same direction. So if I were to take, so I'm taking carbon number one and carbon number four, all right? When I'm in the alpha configuration, remember that I'm going to need an OH and I'm going to need an H. I want to leave an oxygen behind. And basically the link's going to go carbon, oxygen, carbon. So take this and transcribe it right here, and you can see that I got OH and HO. When they react, I can get rid of the water, and it goes carbon, oxygen, carbon, and the molecules remain in the exact same configuration. Does everybody see what I'm saying? Let me go ahead, and I'll try to draw this up. I hate this kind of stuff. But you should love it. Okay, so there's my ring, and I'm just going to draw in what's going on on carbon number one, just for brevity's sake. So there's my hydrogen and my oxygen, and then over here, I would have uh, my hydrogen and my OH. Okay, now I want to react carbon number one here 
with a second. So I'm just drawing part of the molecule here on the second one. And it's going to have the H, and it's going to have the OH. So here is my water that I'm going to get rid of that now allows the formation of that bond. Okay, That's what it looks like in the alpha configuration. Both of the glucose molecules remain structurally in the same orientation. So all the OHs are down, all the H's on the 3 are down, all the OHs are down there on 2, and then everything else going on top. Now when I get over to my beta configuration, I end up with my OH. I'm sorry, I'm just writing down the wrong. There you go. Ignore that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Don't write that down. Delete it. In the beta configuration, the 1 4 linkage, those molecules, so we're looking at this molecule now, each one is going to be rotated 180 degrees. And I'm, I'm going to try to draw this up here in just a second. Okay, so the orientation of the glucose molecules, they're rotated 180 degrees from each other. Okay, so let's try to do this. Okay, again, I'll just draw the first and then the fourth carbon. Okay, so, oops, wrong way. H and OH. Okay, so in that first carbon, OH to H. Now, if I want to react with the fourth carbon here, if I just put it in in the exact same orientation, OH. H, and over here I have my OH and my H. Okay, so OH and H, they line up, and I don't have everything to make the water. So now instead of using it like this, I have to rotate it 180 degrees. And so when I rotate it 180 degrees, The orientation looks more like that, and I'm going to have OH here, and the H <coughs> here on this side, and then over on this side, I now will have my H. So now, when I line these two up, I have OH, and I have the OH lined up. So now they will react and I'm going to form that water. And the way that they draw that structure is to represent like that. Okay? I'm going to stick here just a second. So all I'm doing is I'm just rotating that glucose molecule 180 degrees to get the, the OHs to line up so they can react correctly. But there's a huge consequence to doing this. This is going to form in the beta configuration it's going to form a linear structure. Now, what I'd like you to do is imagine this molecule lined up, take this molecule and reflect it down. So this part of the molecule lines up here. This part of the molecule lines up here. Does, does everybody see what I'm saying? If you don't know what I'm saying here, let me let me try to draw this out just a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to put in just the OHs on this linear molecule, on above and below the plane. So H, OH, H, OH, H, OH. 
So this is all bound together. So I have multiple linear cellulose molecules. And I'm saying that those linear cellulose molecules are going to have this structure that looks something like this, right? Just the bottom here. Is everybody following what I'm saying? Now, what would happen if I take this and rotate it 180 degrees and put it right down here? Now I have OH, H, OH, oops. OH, H, OH, H, OH, H. Carbon, 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 carbon. Carbon, 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 carbon. Carbon and hydrogen's electromagnetic are very close together. We have a distribution of electrons that's very equal here. Here, it's oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen becomes a little more positive. Hydrogen, oxygen becomes a little more negative. I'm creating hydrogen bonds. And so now, I guess I should have just brought this picture up. Let's ignore that picture. This is probably not good. So I line these up. This is only possible with that alternating structure. And so now I get it lined up just right that I can begin to develop these hydrogen bonds. And so now molecules begin to adhere together. And so now it's not just a single strand of cellulose, it's multiple strands of cellulose all being strapped together. And I can begin to build cord-like structures that can get incorporated into places like the cell, the cell wall or other places that will help to store uh, or structure those molecules. In other words, because I can create those hydrogen bonds by rotating those molecules, I now can use cellulose The cellulose molecules to align. To form microfiber-like structures, such as this structure here. And these microfibrils can be utilized in places like the cell wall to give the cell wall its structure. Is this a molecule and what's under that? A line. So those molecules align. They're able to fit together now and we can build these structures based off of hydrogen bonds and you get these mi microfibers that are very, I mean, it's like conduit that you put in concrete, right? Rebar that you put in concrete. We have now a structural support that you can add into a variety of different pieces. All right, why don't we go ahead and stop there?